Good morning. I'm Jeff Hammond, Executive Director at IGSPA. Welcome to the May Town Hall. We're excited to have a very interesting topic with Christopher Manns on uh, efficiencies and uh, equipment ratings. So before we get started with Christopher, I have just a few slides to go over. We'll update everyone on what's happening with the latest IGSPA news. I'll uh, read a little bit about uh, Christopher's background and we will turn it over to him. So we'll start off with uh, the latest IGSPA news. And just so you know, the town hall and uh, dig deeper webinars are, are very, very popular. We do have all of the speakers filled for town halls. We have one opening in October for a dig deeper webinar. So if you're interested in speaking, go to the website, igspa.org, and click on the events training menu at the top, and you'll be able to submit an abstract for that uh, dig deeper. Also, we're accepting abstracts for 2024, so uh, feel free to submit your ideas. We'd love to hear from you. We still have openings for sponsorships for these town hall and dig deepers, and uh, that's the same location. Just click on the link in that in that same events and training area. Did want to give you an update on our 2023 conference in December. Registration is live, so you can go ahead and register for that uh, event. Also, uh, booths are available if you're going to exhibit it at the, at, the, at the show. We have sponsorship opportunities, advertising opportunities. So now's the time to get uh, get your brand out there or attend and uh, and meet us in Vegas. I'm glad to see we're already getting uh, a lot of sponsors. You can see we have uh, the diamond sponsorship still available. There is one gold sponsorship left, a couple of silver sponsorships, and four bronze. And we thank all of our, our current sponsors. Um, this is what's great about recording these sessions. Your logos are going to be out there for uh, eternity. So now is the time to get your sponsorship. Same with the uh, exhibitors. You can see here we have already four exhibitors. There's quite a bit of space left, but these, if it's like last year, uh, we will completely fill this geothermal pavilion. It's in a great location. It's right at the uh, entrance. There are two entrances, one straight ahead of the registration and one to the left side as you walk in. And so in this case, uh, the, the entrance is right here and over here. So this is a great location if you're wanting to attract uh, visitors to your uh, booth. The advertising opportunities are for the program guide. We have quarter, half, and full page ads, plus the inside front cover and back cover. Those are still available, but, it, but of course the inside front cover is, a, is a, a single option as well as the back cover. So if you're interested, go to igspa.org and you'll be able to find more information. We are still looking for conference presenters until the end of this month. We already have 25, which is great. So if you, if you would like to present at the conference, you'll want to do that relatively quickly. Uh, we will be looking um, towards the you know late June, early July to make decisions. And also this year, we have uh, and the availability to submit an idea for a new track. We have our residential, commercial, and loop installer or driller tracks but also we may have some new ideas submitted and uh, that gives us additional topics. If you're interested in speaking at the conference, you'll wanna do that pretty quickly. Go to igspa.org and, uh, and then to the conference page and you'll see a link for submitting an abstract. As far as CEUs and renewals, uh, this town hall as well as Dig Deepers do qualify. Make sure that you send uh, a chat message with your email address and your name. Both of those would be very helpful. And Sally will keep track of those uh, for your certification renewals. Just a little bit of housekeeping. If you would, please submit your questions in the chat and I will read those at the end of the presentation. If we don't get all, to all the messages today, then we'll do our best to uh, get back to you as soon as possible. Also, if you're not speaking, please mute your microphone. And uh, we will be recording this session for viewing later on. Usually it's a couple of days after the uh, session. It'll be on the igspa.org website. If you look at the very top, you'll see a YouTube icon. When you click on that, you'll find um, uh, this session uh, being recorded as the May Town Hall. All right, one more item here to take care of, and then, uh, then I'll introduce Christopher. So this is just a disclaimer and potential conflict of interest to make sure that everyone is aware of what this presentation is. 
The upcoming presentation represents the opinion of the presenter and does not represent any official position, opinion, or endorsement of any products or services by IGSPA or its members. IGSPA town halls and dig deeper webinars are for member updates and education on the latest information in the geothermal heat pump industry and are not meant to endorse one technology or brand over another. It is the presenter's responsibility to disclose any conflict of interest or position that may arise in the content of the webinar. With that, I would love to introduce Christopher Manns. He is the Director of Residential Product Marketing at Water Furnace International and is responsible for product development, product launch, and warranty for the company. In his 20 years with the company, Christopher has had roles of increasing responsibility, including product manager, manager of engineering and research, and director of warranty. Christopher holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Purdue University, Fort Wayne, and we're thrilled to hear from him today. Take it over, Chris. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's exciting to talk about the industry and the challenges that we face in the ratings that we see in the industry. So that's the topic that I'm excited to talk about today. So as we've, for those of you who have been in the industry for a long time, these terms of EER, IEER, and SEER, HSPF and COP become kind of standard lingo. And um, we tend to understand at least to some degree what they mean. But for the average person who is purchasing a product, they're very confusing. Um, and many people don't understand how to compare one product rated in one category versus another. To further enhance that confusion, we as the industry decided to come up with M1 standards, and I'll explain them in a little bit, but those M1 standards created EER2, SEER2, HSPF2, and COP2, and that enhances our confusion. So I want to start today with cooling ratings, the EER2, IEER, and SEER2. So what does a consumer see as they go to purchase a product? There are many uh, variable refrigerant flow products that have rated in IEER. As you can see on the left, just an example of a picture of a product that has an 18 IEER. In the middle is a ducted split system that has an 18 SEER, SEER, and then a geothermal heat pump on the right with an 18 EER. And so as you look at that across the industry, there's many times where the consumer will look at these and say, oh, they're almost the same, very similar, and just choose on price, convenience, whatever, and they don't get the true benefits of the differences of the ratings. So to start with EER, which is the basis of all the ratings, it's an energy efficiency ratio, which is an instantaneous ratio of the efficiency of cooling capacity divided by the um, energy consumption of the air conditioner or air or geothermal heat pump, and it's measured in BTUs per watt. And all equipment today is rated in EER and published at some condition. If we move next to IEER, it's the integrated energy efficiency ratio, and it takes the EER, at four separate conditions for an air source heat pump. And it weights the amount of time that that air source heat pump will operate at each condition and each capacity to come up with a number for that. So the, the, you spend 2% of the time at the maximum, 67 or 62% of the time at 75% of the capacity, 24% at 50%, and then 12.5% of the time at 25%. And 
this really gives a lot of benefit to variable speed equipment and compressor technology. A SEER rating is the seasonal energy efficiency ratio, and it is designed to calculate the total cooling capacity demand over an entire season and divide that by the, the energy consumption of the system in that same period. The SEER rating is calculated by a very complex algorithm um, that's listed in HRI 210, 240, if you'd like to go through and understand exactly how it's calculated. But it takes 132, 134 pages um, to do that. But if you think about it from the aspect of a calculation, it, the algorithm is more complex, but it's very similar to the calculation methodology from IEER. One of the clear things that makes it difficult though is it's based on climate zone four, which is the yellow regions in the pictorial that I have on the bottom right. And that uh, means that if you are in Miami, you have a significantly lower operating efficiency over the cooling season than what the rating is. And if you're in zone seven in Minnesota, you have significantly higher efficiency. So it doesn't necessarily drive you to a comparison of your locale. One of the myths that we continue to see in the industry, um, and we hear it from contractors and uh, consumers a lot, they get told that there's a way Many times it's EER times 1.15 in order to calculate what your SEER rating is. Sometimes that's true at some conditions, but generally it's, um, it's not accurate. And there's not really a direct conversion. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to write 134 pages of documentation to get the calculation. So next, I want to kind of give a brief synopsis of the difference between SEER 1, the old ratings, and SEER 2. Again, it's designed to give minimum efficiencies and redefine what those minimum efficiencies are for all air source products on the market, both ductless and ducted. The new SEER 2 ratings are lower, and the minimum efficiencies will show that they're lower. So for those in, in, that do mostly geo only, um, you'll see that the numbers of SEER 2 are lower and they give, uh, and so you'll have to look at those again. Um, all ducted products have to do a higher static in order for the SEER 2 rating. And at the end of the result is on average, you get approximately 5% difference in SEER 1 to SEER 2 with SEER 2 being a lower rating number. Another challenge of air source products is combinations of ducted, of ducted systems and matched sets. So this chart is designed to show a particular example of an air source 18 SEER product line that has a match set, which in, the, in its marketing materials is 18 SEER, which is accurate representation of the three ton best set. If we look then at three ton versus four ton versus five ton, the efficiency goes down as you get the higher tonnage. That is simply due to the laws of physics and cabinet size and compressor capacity versus heat exchanger size in order to maintain efficiency. And that happens on literally all equipment. So air source, geo, or um, any uh, packaged air source. The difference is we have to be very careful when we put sets together where we mix one air handler with an outdoor system, 
because that can reduce our efficiency rating by 10% if you look in the worst case scenario of that same system. As many of you know, um, our geothermal systems don't have that disparity. They're factory tested for performance. One, even on splits, it's a particular air handler with a particular split system, outdoor split, indoor split, whatever it's matched to. The, pub, the efficiencies are published at all conditions so you can see the numbers and you get performance monitoring of systems of their energy consumptions and things like that from multiple manufacturers in the industry providing that data to the contractors. And that allows us to publish charts that you see on the right that allows us to um, look at annual operating costs of a system along with monthly operating costs and tools that allow you to click on an individual state and see what the average cost of the system is in a given area. So let's talk next about how do we do a comparable condition based on published data that a consumer can go research. So air source equipment has a published EER at 95 degree outdoor air temperature and a geothermal has a published EER at full load at 77 degree entering water. So the question that we all would ask is, well, how is that a, an equivalent comparison of two technologies using two different rate, two different conditions? This illustration is designed to show the conditions and why they're the same. So if I start with the ground temperature in the bottom left, the ground temperature across the United States is typically 55 degrees plus or minus 10 degrees. There are some extremes where it's slightly off that, but that kind of gives you uh, a very good view. That allows us to design loops that will run at full load in the 77 degree loop temperature range most of the season. That then is comparable when you have a 95 degree outdoor air day, your geothermal system will operate with a 77 degree loop temperature and we can look at a direct comparison of the two technologies and how they're rated. So, obviously, those are not the conditions that you would operate it at all year long. So, sorry, I have automatic lights. So, if we look at this, the rating um, efficiency varies from 55 degrees, where you have a very small difference, to 125 degrees, which is an outdoor temperature in, in a climate similar to Phoenix, Arizona, and the ratings go down as the temperature goes up. So where you have a 10% difference in your EER at 55 degrees, you have about a 30% difference. And this is a comparison of a high efficiency air source heat pump to a mid tier geothermal heat pump at 95 degrees. So it's about a 30% difference. And we'll show the exact numbers when we get closer to the end of the presentation. The same thing happens to capacity as the temperature goes up, your capacity goes down. And, and this is again on a typical three ton system and it ends up being about 28% less because your loop temperature meets an equilibrium. And the higher the outdoor temperature, you have very limited impact on your loop temperature as, you, as, the, temp, as the air temperatures get higher and higher. 
This then allows us to look at our EER ratings as compared to the SEER rating of the piece of equipment. So if I look at a 14 SEER 2 piece of equipment, my EER is about 11. As I go up in SEER rating, 18, 19 SEER, I reach a kind of a max typically of between, of about 13, some maybe as high as 14 or 15. But the geothermal at that same comparison, 77 degree water is at 19.7 on a mid-tier ground, ground source heat pump. So why do I care? Um, as we electrify the United States and we move away from carbon-based heating and cooling systems, the challenge that we face is the electrical grid. And as you can see from this, you have a significantly higher capacity that you need for the electrical grid if air source heat pumps are applied. And we need to be able to use a common methodology of a comparison so that at a peak load, we can explain to consumers why there's a benefit to go to ground source. And then again, if you look at the matched sets, the number becomes even uh, more disparity um, as we compare them. If you don't get the best match set for that uh, electrical grid challenge. So next, I'd like to move on to the heating ratings. So those are typically measured in, or published in HSPF and COP. And if we look at the multiple conditions, we have an even bigger challenge in heating of conveying our message of efficiency. So in cooling, we had 18 SEER, 18 IEER, 18 EER. And the numbers are the same but rating, rated a different way. When we go to heating, we actually get an HSPF that is in some ways double the value of the COP rating. This causes to have a lot more education for the consumer to publish an equivalency and level the playing field. So HSPF is the heating seasonal performance factor. It's the heating required for a space over an entire heating season divided by the electric consumption in the same way that SEER was for a cooling season, HSPF is designed for a heating season. The ratio is expressed in BTUs per watt hour, the exact same as a SEER calculation. A couple challenges. It does not include electric heat usage as the capacity goes down in order to offset the load of the home. So most air source heat pumps have a cutoff point between zero and 30 outside air temperature. And even if you go lower, will show that the efficiency continues to decline. And then the lower the cutoff temperature that you choose, the more defrost operation that happens. That's significant because the HSPF rating is rated for zone four, just like the SEER rating. And as you get higher in zones, zones five, six, and seven, the efficiency and the HSPF rating decreases. So similarly to uh, SEER 1 to SEER 2, the HSPF rating is changed on January 1st of this year. It requires additional static pressure for the testing. Um, the calculations also went through significant changes, 
And that's again defined in uh, the multiple pages in the standard. The number of bin hour table changed to allocate more hours to lower temperature regions. And due to those changes, we see HSPF ratings going down by up to 15% in some cases. So 8.8 .8 went to as low as 7.5. As we go forward and further look at HSPF ratings, some areas like Canada are starting to ask for ratings in not only zone four, but zone five. And by mo moving to, from zone four to zone five, as you see in a table published by one manufacturer on one particular product line, the ratings for zone four at 10 would go down to eight or a further 20% reduction in the HSPF rating just by going from zone four to zone five average conditions. So next we'll look at COP, which is the other heating rating can, uh, standard. It's coefficient of performance and it's measures as the instantaneous heat produced divided by the, cons the power consumed by the unit. But instead of BTUs per watt, it's actually measured in watt per watt and becomes a unitless rating. It's used for air source and geothermal heat pumps and published. Again, it does not include electric heat usage on air source or geothermal, but the difference here is the amount of electric heat usage by an air source product is determined by the outdoor temperature and the number of hours and heating degree days in a given year for the uh, air source, but the geothermal system once it finds the equilibrium between out between temperature and or between capacity and the ground, your loop temperature will stabilize and we at a sort of a minimum temperature and it becomes much more stable. And so we can design to electric annual electric usage of 10% or less. Again, we know geothermal heat pumps have factory tested, published efficiencies, and we can monitor the performance. And again, most manufacturers have a way to look at a system with new controls and understand exactly how that system is performing for the catalog against the actual performance in the field. And that data is published. So how do we get published comparison of heating conditions? An air source have COP ratings that are rated at five degrees on HRI website, but 17 degrees is published by the manufacturers to the uh, HVAC contractors. And geothermal heat pumps are published at 32 degree entering water. Those conditions line up very well to the conditions that systems would see on a cold day in the winter. Again, your loop temperature or your ground temperature, excuse me, is 55 degrees. Your loop temperature is designed at kind of at a minimum for 32 degree loop temperature. And that's where we want to design it to become stable and at an equilibrium with the 55 degree ground. And the outdoor temperature again, 17 degrees goes up and down um, with the weather. So what does COP degradation look like as outdoor temperature varies? As you can see, at 65 degrees outdoor temperature, when you need very little heating, they're similar, and it goes down as the temperature goes down. 
and we get 10% delta at 65 degrees and a 40% uh, difference at 17 degree outdoor temperature. As we further go down in temperature, if you get to cold climates, again, the ground temperature will, the difference between the loop temperature and the ground temperature will meet a uh, equilibrium of the temperature difference and it'll become fairly stable. And as the air, soar, air temperature goes down, and I'll show you in a minute the, the uh, published information from uh, government labs, the COP on air source below five degrees tends to dip even more. The capacity stabilizes at low temperatures for geo when the loop meets equilibrium and the air, air capacity starts to trend even faster down once you get below 17 degrees. So it's pretty stable at 14% difference in capacity on a three ton system for at, at outdoor temperature 65. As the outdoor temperature goes down, it stays the same down to 17. And then, it, and then you get stability in geo and the air source tends to taper off. So from National, Resource, National Renewable Energy Labs in Colorado, they published a report that was, uh, the testing was actually commissioned by an electrical, electric utility to show COP and heating efficiency with outdoor temperature. And as you can see, this trend of air source follows the trend that we just showed. And, it and the delta is because it's a variable capacity system, the efficiency at each of those conditions is in a range from lowest COP at a given temperature at full capacity to the lowest operating uh, speed that the compressor can operate at, um, at, that, at that condition. But as you look at the trend, as the outdoor air temperature goes down, both capacity, here shown by maximizing the speed of the compressor and the trend going down, and then COP in red, follow the same trend that I showed in the direct comparison of what we see in, when we compare equipment. And the key here is, if I look at a outdoor temperature of 10 degrees outdoor temperature, again, lower than the 17 degree compare, but geo stays stable, I have to go to get the same COP, I have to go to a 50 degree outdoor air temperature to hit that same COP. And again, I'm operating at a low speed on the air source to get the high efficiency, and I'm operating at full load on the geo to get equal to get an equal value of COP when I do that comparison. So this is a good chart to show people the, the actual efficiency benefits of GEO. So if I use the same uh, SEER rated products on heat pumps, again, I'm doing a heating COP as compared, and on some products, it's as low as almost half. And that's a big deal for a utility that has a high load and peak condition in the middle of the winter when they're trying to build out the grid again for electrification purposes. So DOE has published this chart of minimum efficiency uh, ratings. And the key thing to take away is no air source unit meets the geothermal minimum requirement. And the most efficient, efficient air source heat pump comes to a, within 15% below 
the minimum geothermal product that we can have per DOE. So now we'll take to the level comparison. I showed previously um, a 19 SEER option that's in the ratings that has a lower HSPF. So here I look at one, the best, one of the best, and you can see I'm at 2.9 to three, whereas the geo at, at that condition for the direct comparison is at 4.2. And then on the EER levels, we typically have 13 at on a uh, 21 SEER 2 product, and the mid tier uh, GEO is at 19.7. This allows, and then you can see on a capacity standpoint at those conditions, the, the capacity is fairly similar on three ton systems, both in cooling capacity and in the heating capacity. So we're doing a fairly direct compare of published systems. If you wanna get into further, so that's kind of the way to look at the efficiency rating comparison. And then if you wanna get further details into operating costs, um, all of the geothermal manufacturers and some independent tools have annual operating costs of the geothermal systems. Water Furnace just happens to call theirs GeoLink. And that allows us to have the annual operating cost comparison. As you can see, we publish uh, uh, the ratings at, uh, when we have a mid efficiency geo system, it is about five to $6 per million BTUs. And it goes up to $20 for the comparison of an older 10 SEER unit that you would be replacing. We do the same thing for um, heating systems um, from a mid efficiency geo system at $9. And then you do the comparison to approximately $14 for a 16 SEER system. And then it goes up as you compare fuels. And as you can see in the presentation, um, we do a calculation based on our annual operating tool. And we pub and you can see the electrical ratings are the, the cost of fuel type in the chart below. At this point, um, that concludes my presentation, subject to whatever questions we have. Great. Thanks, Christopher. That was uh, really, really helpful and um, informative for sure. I appreciate you doing that presentation. We get confused with all the acronyms that are out there. Um, let me take a look at our questions here. Uh, Lester asks if this PowerPoint will be available. Um, we do have this session recorded and it will be on our YouTube channel. If you'd like the PowerPoint presentation, is that available? Yes, we, we can. We can make we'll send that to you. Jeff, um, I guess I have a couple slides that I put water furnace on. I'll clean those up and send them to you. Okay, very good. So if you'll just send an email to uh, info at ixpa.org, uh, then okay. we'll make sure you get that presentation. And uh, Will has a comment here, I guess more than a question. Uh, a air source heat pump advertised in quotation marks COP. In other words, what you will see in the brochure is measured at 47 degrees Fahrenheit outside temperature. COP and capacity efficiency ratings at 17 Fahrenheit are found in the AHRI directory. Did you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, so that's correct. So most of them have it at 47 and now have them at five degree outdoor temperature. Um, and but actually, but a lot of the manufacturers put it into their catalogs for contractor usage. Okay, excellent. Yep. I, I don't see any more questions, but I do have one that I'd like you to comment on, if you don't mind. Um, uh, okay. You mentioned COP and, and uh, SEER and, and EER, how they relate to peak demand for the grid. And uh, there were some of your examples, especially with COP, it was almost twice the COP for a geothermal, which is going to have a big impact on the grid. But they didn't include electric heat. Uh, have you done any calculations that show um, 
the COP and the electric heat and and, it, and its impact on the uh, KW demand for the grid? Um, so we do have those ch those charts um, as as a company. I don't have them today, but um, you do get a pretty significant difference just simply because the capacity as the capacity goes down, you have to make that up with a one COP. Okay. The other thing that we continue to talk about is there are um, a lot of now cold climate heat pumps, which operate down to minus five, minus 10. But what the chart shows there from NREL is that the efficiency level can be as low as 1.1, 1 .1, 1 between 1.1 and 1.8, depending on the system. And you might be better off to operate an air source heat pump with some electric heat to supplement that, especially when you get an air source heat pump that is not running as fast and can actually at, and running it full load rather than overclocking a variable speed compressor. And it will allow you to actually have better efficiency by running elect some electric heat and the higher efficiency from the compressor. Okay. Excellent points. And so, so definitely for, uh, there, there's a big impact on the grid, um, geothermal versus, uh, versus air source. And we have a, a bunch of questions coming in now. Okay. Uh, Tom asks, uh, how do we get the industry, how do we as an industry get this important data slash comparison to consumers and decision makers? Any comments on that? Yeah, so um, I've been, as I went through this um, and you asked for, ab, as Ixba asked for abstracts, I've been thinking about this and how do we publish a brochure that does these direct comparisons and shows um, what I'm going to say not direct numbers, but we need to publish the trends of the efficiency capacity numbers for air source versus um, versus geo, as well as some of these charts that I showed of the different efficiency ratings, because there's different impacts depending on different audiences. But I think we need to put together a brochure that directly shows this. And how to and get that out. So I think that would be something that we as an industry could put together. Um, so I'd love to work with the expo to figure out how we do that. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and we could involve uh, geo exchange as well. I think that's a great yep. idea. Um, so a lot of good comments on uh, on how this information is helpful. Uh, here's another uh, question from Jim. This is long overdue. Are there standards committees looking at leveling at leveling the playing field in published ratings? <laughs> yes. So what what I would say is we are trying to, as an industry, figure out what is the level rating that we should all standardize on and move to that so that you get something that shows the annual operating cost comparison of all technologies in all zones and you can and a consumer could look at a direct comparison the challenge is i think as an industry the other technologies would prefer that we not get to that clear of a comparison for a consumer good point good point uh larry has a question Following on, on Tom's comment, how can we use those latest slides to get information in front of homeowners uh, slash potential customers? I guess it's sort of related to the previous discussion. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I think that the clear need is, as we review this, is some method of showing all of those comparisons in a simplistic form that we can hand to a consumer and show the def difference. And I, I, I think the presentation starts doing that, and then we've got to turn it into something that we can hand out and make it easy. Perfect. All right. Chad has a question. Instead of using COP, do you have any comparisons available showing the seasonal performance factor of air source heat pumps versus ground source heat pumps? I think that would magnify the advantage of the two technologies. 
we don't yet, um, except for when we look at the operating costs from the tools that we that we publish, and the and the challenge is COP to COP really only gets us to air source heat pump to ground source heat pump, and a lot of consumers are using fossil fuel heating sources today, and that's. And, and that's why we have tended to trend to uh, the annual operating costs versus ratings. But I think that there's a way to start moving towards um, rating to rating uh, comparisons and publishing them. Okay. But, but I wanna further comment, sorry, Jeff. The, the other challenge that we face is until we have a HRI recognized common number, we can't publish direct comparisons of a number that we have um, generated as compared to a standard number that the industry has approved. So we have to work through standards committees at AHRI to get those ratings published before we can use the direct comparison of number to number. Very good. Okay. Uh, Will has a, a question. Uh, this is the, this is the level of understanding that we strive to share with the utility industry. Clearly, we've been successful in New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Vermont, South Carolina, Oklahoma, and a few others. We have much work to do in other states. So I guess that's more of a comment than a question. And looks like we have a volunteer, Ryan Dougherty from GeoExchange says, I'd be thrilled to package this and start promoting it to policymakers, regulators, utility executives, and others. So we have a direct uh, to-do list um, to add here, um, which is great. Uh, yep. Dan asks, any, any plans to add life cycle cost comparisons in brochures slash contractor available documents? So we as a company have on our website as well as in um, a slide deck that um, we use the term reliable renewable, which is our trademarked um, uh, uh, method of communication, I guess. Um, we have some of those comparisons of life cycle costs and those differences that, that um, we share with contractors. And you, so you can go out on our website and take a look at the operating costs over a life cycle. We typically use um, the range of 30 years. Um, to show that it, you will replace an air source heat pump. You'll, you'll typically in 30 years be on your third air source heat pump as you replace your, your first geothermal system. Okay, very good. Well, I don't see any more questions at the moment. Uh, would you like to, to add any additional comments, Christopher, um, at this point? I, I don't think that I have anything. If anybody has... Um, questions or comments that you'd like to have me answer. Um, it's a pretty simple email. It's chris.mans at waterfurnace.com. So if you have questions that come up and you, or something you'd like answered, you can email me. Very good. Well, I appreciate your time, Christopher. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us on this town hall. It, it is recorded and it will be on the IGSPA website at IGSPA.org. Just click on the YouTube icon at the very top. Look forward to our next town hall and dig deeper webinar. Thanks everyone, have a great rest of the week. Thank you.